Hello, everybody, and welcome to this evening's seminar. Um, my name is Professor Heather Marquette, and I am a professor in development politics at the University of Birmingham. Um, I'm the lead of a research program called SACASE, the Serious Organized Crime and Anti-Corruption Evidence Research Program, and I'm seconded part-time to uh, FCDO here in the UK as Senior Research Fellow. Um, I am very pleased to be here uh, kicking off the fifth in the CIVAD series on illicit economies, finance, and development, brought to you by SOAS and RUSI. Um, before we get started with our talk tonight, I just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, for all of those who are joining us this evening, if you could please make sure that your microphones are muted and your cameras are turned off while the seminar is happening, that would be great. Um, and the seminar tonight is being recorded as well, so please do bear that in mind. Um, I'm extremely pleased to welcome Oliver Gadney here tonight. Uh, Oliver is going to be talking about creating and implementing financial disruption strategies and the successes and challenges of this from a UNODC perspective. Oliver works for uh, UNODC. Uh, for the Global Program Against Money Laundering, Financing of Terrorism and Proceeds of Crime, which has a shorter acronym than you would have for the very long time, <laughs> so GPML. Um, he manages a range of projects that provide technical assistance and mentoring to member states globally on counterterrorism finance and financial disruption methodologies, which we're going to be hearing about tonight. These are in relation to forestry crime and proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. So a, quite a, a wide remit for, for Oliver's work. And prior to joining UNODC, he was a detective in the UK's Counterterrorism Command at New Scotland Yard uh, in London, where he specialized in financial investigation and covert operations as well. Um, before I hand over to Oliver, just to let you know what to expect this uh, this evening, we decided that rather than Oliver doing one full presentation followed by Q&A at the end, we're actually going to split it up into three sections and then have Q&A after each section as well. The first one is going to look at what success looks like. The second one is on the UNODC's financial disruption methodology in detail, and that will be the, the longest part of, of tonight's talk. And then finally look at successes and challenges um, in, in Oliver's experience and at UNODC as well. So we'll be looking for Q&A after each section. With that, please use the chat to put any questions or comments, and we'll be keeping an eye on that. And you can also raise your hand um, when we get to Q&A as well, and I'll be here to let people know uh, when, when we're at that stage as well. So unless I've forgotten anything, I think I'm going to hand over to Oliver now, um, who'll start talking us through. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Heather. Um, and I'm, look, I'm conscious of our audience as well being not just um, law enforcement um, background, but also academia, journalists, policy makers as well. Um, and those within the academia also being both at the start of their, their careers, but also those um, later on in their careers. So I hope this uh, next hour, hour and a half or so is gonna be relevant for um, all of you. And the title, um, don't be kind of distracted or put off by the title. I, I hope it's gonna help you um, as we go through thinking about these kind of disruption strategies from your point of view of um, opportunities for more focused research. Um, and we'll come into an area around critical information requirements um, around the business models of illicit financial um, finance. Maybe also um, for those who uh, represent NGOs or other campaigners, either journalists or, or sort of non-official journalists, um, this is methodology is a campaigning tool as well. So although it's a um, disruption methodology, think also as a campaign planning methodology as well. Um, let me uh, share a screen and we'll, we'll kick off. So thanks again for, for the opportunity and, and thanks to the team for Tom, Antonio, and Catherine for setting this up and, and Heather as well for, for chairing this as well. Um, we will split into the three parts, and so please do fire in questions. Um, I'll try and make it as interactive as possible. Um, and forgive me in advance as well if I use some sort of strange um, sort of anachronism. Some of the language in this, this in, in financial disruption planning can actually be a, a real hindrance. And I, I'm very conscious that our audience are from all around the world as well. And we do deliver this, um, this kind of course around the world. So I hope you'll see um, 
they're able that, uh, to tailor it to, to your needs. So we're going to look at uh, three key areas, uh, measuring success and disruption planning. I'll be fairly brief. Um, it's for all of you, it's probably totally obvious, but for often the people who are actually doing financial disruption planning, it's not. So, um, but I hope we'll be able to um, break a few uh, um, preconceptions on that. Um, then we'll run through a, a sanitized disruption methodology, um, a, an actual plan, which, which I believe has been briefed very recently to a, pres a recently elected president. Um, and then coming on to um, successes and challenges. And um, so part one, uh, measuring success and disruption planning. If we, um, if we look at the, the difference between impact and performance, and here's two, two sort of fairly simple examples. Look at the difference between preventing a criminal organization from trafficking drugs across Route X versus conduct operations which result in a seizure of uh, how many tons of heroin and 250 arrests. So imagine you are given the position, you're, you're in command of a, um, a team and you've been given that, that uh, those two different types of objectives. And it's kind of spot the difference. Some of the key questions which should hopefully arise in, in your mind, which is, what's the size of this criminal operation? What's the size of their, their organization? Is 250 arrests actually going to harm them? Is that tonnage of, um, of heroin actually going to harm them? 250 arrests. Who, are, who exactly are you arresting? Are these kind of small fry? Are they key people with key capabilities? Are they only the hierarchy? What kind of impact would those arrests actually have, just if you're measuring by the numbers? And then the tonnage of heroin, you often hear this in the news that so, so and so tons of kilograms or tons of heroin are seized. What actual impact does that have in the actual supply chain um, from Afghanistan or Golden Triangle through to the consumer market? The, that actual loss. And I, I often liken it to supermarkets who factor in the loss of a certain number of eggs before they actually get to the shelves. Organized crime do, groups do just the same. There are people who are expendable. There are products which are expendable along that supply chain. Product will only bring a certain amount of profit at different parts of the supply chain and the organizations will just balance that risk and that profit. So performance figures we'd suggest are not indicators of impact. They're just, they just demonstrate the work that's done. So when you're trying to plan and, and set your baseline, set your mission, uh, your initial mission analysis, according to figures of performance, we suggest you're in, you're in shaky ground and actually going in the wrong direction. Obviously, performance figures are important, but the impact is essential because that shows that the tools which you're using, the arrests, the seizures, the confiscations, that they're actually working, that they changed, changed the system. And you know, given my background, I've seen in the last um, what, 10 or so years in UNODC that police are notoriously bad at this. And that is a problem because police are often the risk holders. They're often the, the leads who have been entrusted with managing um, organized crime and terrorism risks. Other organizations, whether the military, business, NGOs and campaigners are very good at impact-based disruption planning and campaigning. So you'll see in the disruption methodology as we, we move on, we focus on understanding before disruption. Again, if we think about how our bosses may look at um, our operations, they may see the steady performance indicators, that the numbers of arrests are increasing, the, the, the gradual increase in the, the seizures of tons or how many kilograms of heroin. But we actually know in our heart of hearts, the actual impact we're having is minimal. So what we try to suggest is actually better understanding of the system, better understanding of the supply chain, the business model behind um, whether organized crime groups or, or terrorist groups. And then you can understand if the performance, your, the activities you're taking are actually having an impact. And to that end, we developed a uh, financial disruption methodology. I'd suggest this has been built on, on bones, on, on terrible mistakes which have been made in the past. Um, I don't want to boast about it. It's, it's awful, um, terrible mistakes in, in organized crime, terrorism operations, um, where people just have made basic mistakes, failing to establish clear objectives, impact-based objectives, and only focusing on performance. 
failure to understand the business model, how, how groups raise, move, use and store uh, funds. Not thinking properly about identifying vulnerabilities, both one's own vulnerabilities organisationally or as partnerships, um, but also the vulnerabilities in, in the adversary and, and the criminal group. And then being very blinkered, I, I, I live in Vienna and you have horses going through the street with the blinkers on. Often people get focused just on the tool that they have, whether it's arrest and prosecution or confiscations, and not the whole range of, of different options. And that's why I, I personally really like this topic, because there are so many tools available to people planning financial disruption, financial campaigning against these organisations that, that are available. Then thinking about risk mitigation, one's taking action against uh, the economics within very vulnerable communities. And there's a huge risk of things going very wrong if you take the wrong steps. So thinking about predictive risk and then risk mitigation. And then lastly, judging that indicates of effect. Again, police are very poor at this um, and, and success is based on the arrest once it's happened and failing to collect that kind of information that the post-operational reflections um, from either within the organized crime group or, or around it more, more broadly. Uh, what impact did you actually achieve? So the methodology we've developed, the three kind of parts which we'll talk you through, um, largely helps address each of those issues. It's a, it's a linear uh, planning methodology based around a, kind of a workbook, um, which walks you through the understanding and analysis, then the disruption planning, and then the review. So it's a linear process, but at the same time, it's a cyclic process. Uh, you, once you've completed one turn, you've changed the system a little bit, then you start again, see if your mission's still valid, and then carry on and again, again, and again. I'll just pause there just for questions. Um, Great, thank you, Oliver. Um, for anybody, please put in the chat or raise your hand, but I have a couple of questions to kick us off, Oliver, if that's okay. okay. Um, when you first started talking about um, sort of the, the impact versus performance measures, I could think of all sorts of examples in my, my head. And the, the sort of first question I thought about is, um, would you actually see the use of performance figures um, rather than impact for any good reasons? Because I could think of all sorts of reasons why you would see them for, for poor reasons. And you mentioned law enforcement particularly struggling with this relative to others as well. So just a, a follow on from that was what incentives are there and have you seen for law enforcement and for others to actually use these sorts of measures of, of effectiveness rather than the, the performance indicators that might be um, they might be more comfortable with or might be more flattering or whatever it might be. Thanks. Um, not if you're trying to achieve a kind of a, a, kind of a high level outcome. So when, when we get into the, the mission analysis development, I think it's become kind of patently clear that if your mission is, as I was once given, I want to see four uh, terrorist finance convictions as a result of this lead. I've just given you Ollie. Um, it, it's just, uh, it just doesn't work um, because that automatically restricts you. Um, if, however, um, you have been as part of it, and you'll see in the, the dis different uh, disruption, um, uh, disruption planning tool we come to, if there is a specific task which which is then given to, to one of the team members, you must uh, conduct an arrest operation. I'll give you a, an indicate, uh, a success story at the back, back end of this. Um, and that they needed to see 25 kilos or 25 tons of heroin taken out from this network at this particular time, because that was the crucial time, the crucial place in the supply chain and when it was gonna have the maximum impact. Yeah, maybe, uh, and that's a, but that would be a, a submission as it were, it'd be a kind of a lower level, um, mission. I hope that makes it clear. No, definitely. And I was also thinking about how law enforcement, you know, officers might also be individually accountable in ways that say within mm -hmm. the military or the aid sector, or whoever else it might be, might, might not be as well. So you want yep. to measure your performance. Um, have a question here from Jonathan Goodhand, um, who asks, can you say something about who decides what success looks like and the implications mm -hmm. for the distribution of costs and benefits of disruption strategies? Um, and I, he put a follow on um, behind the question, but I think um, 
probably could have guessed this as well. And so behind the question, he's thinking about the uh, understanding that many poor people may benefit from illicit economies and their livelihoods that depend on them as well. So who gets to decide what success looks like? Um, I'm going to park that one for, and I will come, Jonathan, do, do challenge me if I, if I haven't answered it. I think um, in the, the framing, what kind of mission, um, and bear in mind, we, we're a non-operational team. So we, we simply provide training, mentoring, uh, policy and kind of resourcing. Um, we, we don't set operational objectives, um, but we help national governments um, and different agencies to do, do exactly that. Um, so as you'll see in the, one of the, the following slides when we go through one of the, the examples, um, it's looking um, at the organizational context. And I think that helps to actually frame what, what government wants to see as success. Um, the second point you made is totally valid and I think is so important to this. And this is fundamentally a human rights based um, methodology. And as we go through the, the next kind of fair number of slides, and forgive me for that, but um, it's important you see it, I think. Um, judge for yourself if, if this is a proportional, if, it's, um, if it demonstrates proportionality, necessity, legality, and accountability, fundamental human rights principles in the different steps as you go through. And I'll give pointers to that, but I, you know, it, I'd really welcome um, any input from yourselves. This is a methodology which is always in draft um, and has always been, been under development. So we really welcome your, your comments on that. Sorry to park those two questions, but um, very valid, but I'm, I am going to come to them, I promise. I was say that's okay, because I've written a follow-up question down, and I was thinking, actually, we'll see what you say on success and challenges as well, because that might be great to come back to this. Um, I have one more question, but I'd like to just see if anybody else, um, if you want to add something to the chat before we move on to the next section. But right in the beginning, you said that this is also a campaigning methodology as well. And I couldn't kind of instantly think about, well, actually, what would that look like and who would be doing that? So would you mind saying just something else about when you say it's a campaigning methodology, what would what would that look like? Um, a brilliant NGO, I won't name them, they probably know who they are, um, who campaigns on um, environmental crime uh, based in the US. Um, we visited them and I, I talked through this as a, as a methodology and, and often coming from myself, often coming from, from us and our background, it, it, it gets railroaded a bit into more kind of law enforcement, prosecutions, confiscations, those kind of tools. And you see people's eyes glazing over. Um, but when we started framing the conversation about the kind of um, uh, campaigning they can do, the, the political lobbying, the lobbying with the private financial sector, um, with customer bases as well, and they have a, a, an amazing operation, but they also have some very good um, investigations they conduct, both um, infiltrating criminal organizations and publicizing, and they try and share the, the data with law enforcement, but um, publicizing where, where law enforcement just isn't going to listen uh, for whatever reasons. Um, so they've got a fantastic campaigning methodology as well. But they were asking the questions around how can they get it focused on more, um, in, on achieving more of an impact as opposed to maybe just getting good stories out the door kind of thing. So, um, so I think from that point of view, it's, you'll see that it's, it helps you maybe focus where you, you think you're actually going to achieve an effect and maximize, maximizing the effect you're going to, to achieve. No, that's excellent. And it really says something about how when you're working in a space like this, where it's really complex, and there are all sorts of different types of organizations and actors involved, you're really trying to think about who's going to use this beyond the most obvious as well, and translating it into, into sort of language that, that applies to them and their work really easily, which is great to see. Um, I mean, it's, um, I'd suggest that in, in many countries, um, this is a, a challenging area and I suggest many NGOs, journalist groups and, and other um, influencers can have as much impact against some of these organizations as the traditional kind of law enforcement, prosecution type method and confiscation methods because in, in many countries those methods are just not available, they're just broken fundamentally. Absolutely. Right, I think I'm going to um, ask you to move on to the next yep. section. People can still put questions <laughs> in the chat as well, but but Oliver's going to move on to part two. And I think this will be, like I said, this will be the, the sort of longest section. So so probably about 30 minutes, um, he'll be yep. speaking to us with Q&A afterwards, but I'll be keeping an eye on the chat um, 
just in case. So if you put something there and, and I might need to interrupt earlier, I will do. Um, sure. But otherwise, thanks over to you, Elder. Thanks ever so much. So um, we'll go through uh, the three parts, understanding and analysis, disruption, planning, and then review. Um, and it's uh, unashamedly, it's, it's quite a lot of slides, um, about 20 odd slides. Um, this is a, it's a, it's a real example. We, uh, like I said, we mentor and train different countries on disruption planning methodologies and they may be facing a major insurgency or major environmental crime or, or other organized crime threats. Um, and so we work with them to, to work through and develop their own financial disruption planning strategy. Um, but do think for yourselves about how research, campaigning, um, other specialist tools, if, if maybe you work in other government departments who've um, got other kind of specialist tools as well, because usually I'd suggest those are the ones which are gonna have the most impact against some of these groups. Um, and again, as I, as I mentioned in, in response to Jonathan's questions, have a look at, um, I hope it will come out, but uh, do do look at, if you see um, the, the concepts of proportionality, legality, accountability, and necessity coming out of this methodology. We're not in the business of training the next Gestapo to use financial tools against their own people or, or opposition politicians or journalists uh, who are just doing their, their jobs. And that, that's important that this comes out. So we're going to use a, an example of uh, Country Y, an Al-Qaeda Islamic State terrorist group, which is using mobile money. Um, mobile money, I mean, um, uh, where you have either control of a bank account on your on your phone or you're able to transfer credit from your phone to another, another phone. Um, it, this follows an example of a country in Africa uh, where um, which we were mentoring where, and mobile money is really common and it's a great resource to, to reach people who don't have, have necessarily access to um, banking services. Three, I'm um, looking into a bit more detail um, and we can share resources with you if you get in touch with me at, um, later. Um, but we'll start with understanding and analysis. Um, we'll look through mission analysis and a bit of the context. Very important to learn from previous operations, developing a problem statement, a very simple business modeling. So raise, move, use, and store a very simple audit and forgive me any accountants in the, the audience, but um, you need to keep it simpler first and, that gets, and then it gets pretty advanced. SWOT analysis, by that I mean uh, vulnerabilities analysis, which is a fantastic tool. And then the critical information requirements. And maybe for those of you in, in um, academia, um, Hopefully that will pique your interest about how potentially some of your, uh, your work can be that much more um, instrument effective in um, influencing policy and some operational um, planning as well. Creating a mission statement, I suggest, is probably the hardest step of this. Um, and we've, we've gone over the difference between um, impact and performance. So here is a pretty clear one about, which demonstrates the who, what, where, when and why. So by 2024, July, federal government of why disrupts Al-Qaeda Islamic State, their ability to use mobile money in the country in order to disrupt their, their financing. Short and snappy, but also um, it does not say how. So the federal government of why it's not saying arrests everyone, confiscates, enacts this law. It's leaving it open. And that is very, very important keeping all the options open. Underneath that, you have some spe specified outcomes and then implied outcomes as well. The specified largely follow the disruption methodology of understanding disruption and then assessing your impact. But then why, uh, but then um, the implied ones come a little, get in a little bit more into the detail about uh, developing partnerships, uh, respecting international human rights and also uh, going to that point taking measures to protect the economy and fun economy and financial inclusion of, of the population as well these can be broken out a bit more into what are known as constraints and restrictions so constraints what you must do and restrictions are what you must not do so example on the restriction side you mustn't be breaching human rights. You mustn't be stigmatizing people or disrupting vulnerable economies. 
So just because a terrorist group, a major terrorist group, uses mobile money, it doesn't mean one should stop mobile money from being used. Then if we look at a bit more of the context, uh, kind of organized organizations, so that might be an FIU or police or, or um, intelligence security agencies uh, on the national level and then at the international level, this kind of a, an exercise where you look at the different objectives, I'd suggest this helps you to, to find a friend. Um, and that may, may be friends who either know something or can do something to help you achieve your mission. And this is really useful. People are not so, so interested. There's a lot going on in the world, and particularly in people's different remits. They are not necessarily going to be super interested in money laundering, counter-terrorist financing. But if you can start linking your objectives, your mission, to their objective of improving consumer protection, increased data protection um, and privacy rights, maybe increasing the tax base, uh, maybe safeguarding or opening up new corridors for development financing and people's interest start sparking and you start getting other new people on board. Lessons from history. Um, there is a, um, the reason why we started doing this was we, we saw that there was a, a failure of of having an institutional memory, and particularly in the context of it was in the context of Afghanistan and Iraq, and the counterinsurgency work that was going on there, there is this um, failure because there is such a high turnover of people moving through um, different organisations in the countries which are often involved there, um, and that turnover it creates a, what I'd suggest is a, a kind of a gold a goldfish effect. Um, that once people rotate out of different roles, and that may be because of anti-corruption measures or sort of military equivalent of a promotion structure that you won't stay in your, your given role for a long time, then you move on. And often those lessons are not learned, they're not passed on. And I would suggest this is an opportunity for, for academia, for journalism, but also for international organizations such as ourselves to be able to take on and help um, collate some of those um, usually terrible mistakes, but also some good practices, um, and then share them in a, in a situation where a new, new drama, um, new, new problem sets up. It's important then to start collating. Um, so we've started moving into the, um, out of the, the mission analysis piece first, um, and then into the problem setting um, place um, stage. So understanding what the system is uh, that you're trying to, to impact. And here um, we are developing a problem statement from a full range of different sources. And again, this is an opportunity for, um, and I have seen and how um, NGO reporting, academic reporting has made its way into uh, financial disruption strategies, which, which certainly we've mentored ourselves. And this, um, this is just one page um, of a number of different pages where, um, in this case, um, you can see that the um, Al-Qaeda Islamic State organization is making use of mobile network operators, the services they provide to largely manage their, their finances. They're receiving money from a range of different sources, good amount in this one, so 40 million from their domestic taxation. Um, and when I say taxation, I'm not giving them any legitimacy. That's just how they see themselves as a shadow state. And to be a shadow state, they need, a, need the in same infrastructure that a state does to, to receive, oversee, and then distribute, distribute funds. And I think people often focus on, on terrorist groups as being, they focus on the bomb and, and the bullet, but they focus less on that, the bureaucracy. And most, some of the most advanced terrorist groups have a very developed bureaucracy. We come into a, a sort of simple business modeling, we call it. And part of this is to, to develop that baseline understanding of what the, um, how the, the terrorist group raises, moves, uses, and stores funds. And that raise, move, use, store, it is a very, very simple way of doing a business model. I'd welcome other, other suggestions, but um, 
for now it's like the the who what where where how where when and why of of each of those raised move views and store this is often um a, a kind of collation exercise of collating a full range of different data from uh, which is available um and putting it together into this new kind of structure a business model structure but that helps you start look at the looking uh, helps you to look at the uh, the system which is going to help you actually learn how to actually break it down so here's a simple diagram of the the rays the group is raising money from different individuals from businesses from large businesses they're receiving it through either tax collectors um, they call tax collectors into different mobile accounts these may be then passed to the main holding bank account. And then if we come into the, the move part, how they're moving that out either to um, just a range of different holding accounts and up to those which are then managed by um, the, the leadership figures. And often you see uh, financial commission, ministry of finance, as it were, um, Islamic State in um, Iraq and Syria had a very developed system of uh, financial management. And then how do they actually use it? Passing it out either through uh, mobile money, bank uh, transfers, or through other Hawala type systems um, for, for them to use predominantly for, or just for weapons, usually maybe 10% or so would go on weapons. Um, but it's going to be for all the other kind of uh, other costs um, for um, food, accommodation, transport, all those other sort of slightly more boring costs, which people uh, tend to forget about. And then cash reserves as well. This is a, appreciate this is a pretty basic kind of slide, but behind this within the, the strategy which was uh, developed, there's a whole load more detail that goes into it. Sometimes when you're briefing people, you've got to tailor it to, towards the audience. Um, and that's also important when some of the people you're briefing don't actually um, have a background on the, the illicit finance piece. <clears throat> then we come to, to an audit. So it's kind of take off um, whatever hats you've got and put on the, the accountant hat and think about income, uh, revenue and expense, expenses, um, assets and liabilities. So here we see the revenue coming into the organization uh, from the full range of different sources. So when you look at a, a local economy where terrorist and major insurgencies exist, then you start thinking how I think it's safe to assume that there is some form of relationship. Um, not saying that there's a complicit relationship, but I think it's vital to assume that there's a relationship and try and disprove otherwise. So livestock sales, we saw in uh, West Africa is a huge, huge um, source transportation of, of goods. And don't think that um, terrorists are always going to be simple bandits. They may actually be, to an extent, trying to establish themselves as a um, shadow state. So by create, making a, a business along a supply route unprofitable because they're taxing too much, they're going to be, um, uh, they're not going to be endearing themselves to the population. Often it may be the case actually that they charge less in their taxation than the range of corrupt um, government officials who are also charging different taxation along those routes as well. But sorry, from the bottom line, this helps you to get, get an understanding of how big is this actual organization? What, what kind of beast are we actually, actually dealing with? And then revenue and expenses um, and uh, assets and liabilities as well. Some organizations are, are um, working in an agrarian economy, others are, the economy fluctuates according to the seasons, transportation routes across the, the Indian Ocean has certain peaks and troughs as well. So by establishing a baseline, you can then start doing what we call a, a, a vulnerabilities analysis. So this just uses the simple method of the strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And we suggest it's good to do that on both sides. So both looking at uh, from the friendly side. So here we've got the top part of the uh, SWOT, which is the 
the federal government of why their mission, that mission statement, which um, we read earlier. And then all those factors which will, which are internal and within their control, so the strengths which can support that, so establishing mobile money regulations, and then those weaknesses, a lack of ability to, to investigate as well. Lack of working public-private partnerships. But then you've got the opportunities and threats. And I'm just going to flip over to um, doing a SWOT analysis on the adversary side. You should do the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats on, on both the friendlies, but then also on the adversaries. Just as an example, we've got the AQIS mission. But they took take full advantage of the mobile money uh, system in order to finance their terrorist campaign and maintain the shadow government activities. So here we look at so opportunities and threats. So we do strengths and weaknesses as well, but just examples of opportunities and threats for them. These are external factors which are outside their control. So there's a lack of regulation, general lack of capacity. That's an opportunity for um, the terrorist group to actually make use of mobile money. And threats, well, there may be um, new work by the FIU and um, by the, the central bank to bring about regulations. Once one's done a, a good um, a business model and a good SWOT, a whole load of questions should be arising. That problem statement at the start is just a, the starter. Um, and this should be a process, a cyclic process as well um, of uh, developing um, the intelligence cycle of developing um, new information to meet those specific risks, specific uh, gaps, information gaps which you may have. So this is uh, just a simple way to to check those off and make make sure you've actually got them. And think about who's who's the best one, who are the best people to get the most accurate, cheap, and, and risk free information. So we kind of through the, the understanding and analysis piece, um, and now on to the, the disruption plan. Here we're looking at um, the significant factors. Um, we're not talking about targets. We used to call this targets. Unfortunately, people, what do you do to a target? You usually shoot it or do something to it. So actually targets, um, so significant factors here, this can both be on the, the um, friendly side, neutral or adversary as well. So here we're looking at just some friendly ones, you've got an FIU, you've got the, the National Council on Anti-Money Laundering, you've got the Central Bank, they can issue regulations, they can investigate, and then you've got the different other um, law enforcement agencies who can then take action as well. This is important because this helps you to start charting, thinking about who are you going to want to actually have an effect, either building up people who are on the friendly side, or starting to disrupt and, and take action against people who are on the adversary side. What's really important is, um, what I like about the methodology is that you can start developing um, tools um, and having a, what we call a disruption toolkit. We've got a, a skeleton toolkit which, lasts, which goes up to about 100 odd pages. So you would have thought arrest, prosecute, confiscate, last three pages, but there are a whole range of, of other different options to either find out information or to um, uh, cause effect to uh, terrorist or organized crime groups financing. So here we're looking at what factor, what, who's the person who could, or what's the entity which can actually have an effect, what effect they can have, and what are the different types of options which they've got at their, their disposal. Hopefully this starts ringing that, that bell of the, the proportionality. If you have a given problem, are you only going to arrest and prosecute, or confiscate, or take very, very decisive and, and intrusive action, or are there softer um, and more proportionate methods to do that? And actually often those will be cheaper, they'll require uh, a lower uh, standard of evidence as well um, to be able to bring those about, and often they'll be quicker. So there's some examples of, of just a few of the options which are potentially available in this space, starting to establish secure access to mobile money transaction records. Um, and there's, that's a balance with uh, data protection and, and human rights aspects as well. Senior briefings and awareness to, to uh, teach seniors about uh, the benefits of financial investigations to understand the wider 
um, aspects of the terrorist group as well. Still, we haven't actually developed the actual plan yet. And, and often those, as we're going through these courses, people are sort of really fighting because they want to actually get, get ahead and actually start developing the plan itself. So here we're looking at course of action. And here you can synchronize different course of action into those which are preparing, the, the shaping ones. So maybe training, establishing teams, the decisive side, which is the people who are actually going to take action either to um, which will help directly help your, your mission to succeed and ongoing sustaining activities, which may be resourcing and training. Bringing all this together. So starting from the left is, is the most important part. So the effect, what effect are you trying to achieve? And then you're starting in to think about the different options which are potentially available to you, uh, the different delivery assets, which means who's actually going to physically do it, at what phase, and then starting a, a kind of a, a very simple non-scientific method of grading. What is the actual benefit of this? Is it actually going to be, is it realistic? Is it cost effective? Um, and is it actually going to have any impact? And here we've got a, a, a range of different um, options, and we're going to zoom in on to one particular one, which is about um, the the public-private partnership aspects. So we'll, we'll leave some of the other ones to the side, some of the, the, the other aspects, but just we're gonna focus in on, on those. Again, this kind of, on the actual plan, this went to, to several pages of all the different effects um, which you can you bring to start disrupting the terrorist groups of use of mobile money. <clears throat> we talked on wow. the question about the, the risk mitigation. So this isn't crystal ball, this isn't a scientific thing, this is just the basic understanding of what, from your given primary effect of improving um, or developing public-private partnerships to improve information sharing, what might go well and what might go wrong. And once you start charting it, you're putting it down, you're documenting it and making yourself accountable for if things do invariably, which they do do, and go horribly wrong, how are you gonna defend your position and justify your, your decision-making? So we identify here some of the third order effects. So um, as potential financial exclusion of the population who are unable to fulfill their customer due diligence requirements. Maybe people don't have ID. People who've actually gone through this course in West Africa didn't have ID and we couldn't pay them to get to the, the venue for the training. So eventually we worked with the mobile network operators and got them, got them enough money so they could actually get to the training venue itself. Um, there may be retaliation again uh, against them, the reporting entities. <clears throat> and so you can see the negative scores, which may think, may make you think, is this actually this tool, is it actually going to cause more problems than actual benefits? But then in red, we've got the you know additional measures which you may bring, put into place to mitigate that negative, um, that negative collateral impact. So to, to maybe diminish, I'm not going to wholly get rid of, but diminish the retaliation risks, increase um, increase activity around um, protecting businesses from, from retaliation, um, identifying methods to, to prevent that financial exclusion of different populations as well. So the red here is, is taking, trying to help you soften the blow of some of the, um, some of the negative impacts. So bringing that together, you've developed a, a plan, you've done the risk assessment, you've taken mitigation activities. Most importantly here, you've got the, the indicator effects, just developing a fairly simple plan focused around your mission um, to think what effects would we like to see which, which demonstrate the whip, sorry, what indicators would we like to see which demonstrate that we've had an actual effect. So I'm starting to chart these and starting to think, well, who's actually gonna collect these? People often make the mistake of running their operations, running their activities first, um, and then only thinking about this after everyone's gone out the door to go and do the operation. So here we're encouraging people to, to think about that plan to, to gather those indicators of effect at the outset and be ready for it. That was a lot though, and unashamedly a lot, but I hope it's um, you know, geed up a, a whole load of um, questions. This is only an hour and a half on this, and, and sometimes the course takes about 
five days or so and it can be uh and the mentoring exercise took about five months um to develop the actual strategy but i, I hope that's raised some some thoughts heather over to you Great, thank you very much, Oliver. Um, sort of again, I have some questions here, but I'd like to to hand over to participants first um, to see if anybody would like to ask a question. I've I've had one direct message um, asking about raising their hand, for example. Um, so give people a second to see if anybody is brave to put their hand up first. Okay. Well, people are, are gathering their, their thoughts there. Can I ask you just a couple of questions? Um, like this, my first one, I think, is just from right in the beginning when you first started this section, and it links, I guess, in a way to Jonathan's question. So we were talking about the, the kind of restrictions around the human rights um, and things like sort of the economic uh, displacement factors and stigmatizing. Who, um, who makes those judgments and how would they make those judgments as, as well? Um, so, uh, actual example from um, summer planning in uh, West Africa. So, we we ran this course in, in one country in West Africa where they have a, a huge issue with um, uh, the insurgency, which is well different insurgencies, um, both AQ and Islamic State insurgencies, which are also fueled by um, the background of organised crime, whether it's migration or smuggling. Um, and uh, that identified one particular location um, which they were interested in and um, they decided to conduct an operation to go and start targeting some of the terrorist networks within that uh, within the, uh, that location. They made a, a particular effort to um, identify the, get an understanding of the economic laydown in that, that region because a certain of the targets they were looking at were financial targets. So whether they were Hawala operators, or um, supporting NGO activity in that region. Um, but they used the methodology to, to, to conduct that risk analysis and, and that predictive risk analysis, identified the, the individuals and found a way that the whereby they could detain and, and uh, arrest those individuals while help, helping the, um, the, the village not, uh, sorry, the, the location not to um, suffer from adverse kind of economic impact. And, and they, they made sure the, the indicators of impact that their plan was in place so that they could actually judge for themselves they'd been successful. But they wrote that into their, their operational plan that it wasn't just go in and take out the bad people, um, but actually have a think about what are they at a much higher level trying to achieve. So I hope that, that gives a, an actual example of something that happened three years ago. No, definitely. And it, it, it sort of, to me, one of the points that you made that really that really struck me is, I mean, firstly, when you're looking at, you know, what, what you've set out is a really sophisticated business model that sort of in, in this case, Al-Qaeda is operating. So, you know, criminal groups and extremist groups are, you know, primarily, first and foremost, they have to be successful business people or mm -hmm. else they just wouldn't be, they wouldn't be yeah. um, as successful there. But you made a point about, you um, sort of wanting to, to be a shadow state, in which case they're making calculations exactly like that. So are they generating enough revenue or jobs or whatever it might be for the local community? Are they able to maintain legitimacy? Are they setting their taxes at a level that's um, likely to earn them the revenue they need without causing blowback and so on? Um, and if on the opposite side, those calculations aren't also happening, then you're just going to end up with um, sort of dis displacement effects at best and some really yeah. negative unintended consequences at worst and and I really liked how you you brought in that focus on unintended consequences as well no they um I think that's um on the unintended consequences um uh, part of the methodology for that came out of um a particular operation in Afghanistan where uh, a Hawala operator was moving money for an um, Al-Qaeda associated group. Um, and uh, the, the operation went to just go and take that person out and arrest them and seize all their books. That caused, sure, it caused a very temporary um, disruption to the, the terrorist group because they could just then go to the next next office along the corridor and get a similar services and, and carry on. They didn't lose any money per se. Um, but what it did have an effect of was all the businesses who held accounts with that wire operator who were now 
stuff them and they're, they're, they're businesses they need access to that they need to be able to buy and sell stuff um and so there are really large um disturbances in the street um, people came groups came out people got killed so what turned out to be maybe a well-intentioned no no actually a well-intentioned operation just completely crashed and burned and um, just for want of a basic predictive analysis um so that's where that came from but the, the point you made about this i think from an academic side i think there is a very interesting aspect of on the evolution of small time um, bandits moving into um, acquiring an ideology and uh, becoming terrorists and then starting acquiring um, a professional bureaucracy behind them um, to actually start understanding themselves as a as more of a state and a shadow state and, and exacerbating those the tensions but also filling that filling those voids um, I think that as a, as a risk indicator um, is is certainly overlooked um, and that can be a a really good area for study and, and almost an alert mechanism um, to start judging it. Just here on, on the, the finance side, at what point does this small time um, terrorist group actually become a really worrying uh, potential insurgency? No, excellent. Um, in some of the, our SACACE research we talk about, it sounds a bit cheesy, but it, it works. We talk about trying to think about moving from disruption and displacement. So to disrupt and displace to disrupt and replace. So yeah. what is it that that's actually serving within those communities or whatever it might be? And then how do you um, how do you sort of build things alongside to make sure the disruption activities don't create those unintended consequences? Um, with that in mind, uh, Jonathan's asked another question as well, and I'm going to ask the whole one, even though he says you answered the second part of the question already, but I'd let you hear it here. So how do you make the judgments about the short term versus the long term trade offs? So, for example, disruption may be successful, quote unquote, in the short term, but then displaces the problem elsewhere or leads to greater vertical integration and professionalization. Um, and then the second part is also how do you deal with the illicit uh, and licit entanglements? So the Huwala dealer who moves terrorist money, but they also move money for farmers and local business people. Um, on the first one, thankfully, I mean, I'm not a decision maker in it, so uh, I personally don't. But uh, how does how does one do it? Um, I think by teaching people a, a methodology which they can be held to account by. Um, and um, yeah, I sorry, I, I can't. Maybe I can't answer that more more of a detailed way. Um, I'll have a think. But um, the, the second point about how do you untangle this mess? Yeah, if it was just a simple person who, who'd stolen a loaf of bread or, or whatever, stolen a million pounds out of the bank, it's fairly easy to go and arrest them. But uh, it's not. It's um, it's threat networks who who exist in, um, in spaces where there frankly isn't a government or um, there is only government in, in very small ink spots within our country, within our region. Um, often uh, groups have no concept of the actual borders or borders are simply somewhere at a, a place where you can make more profit either side of them. Um, the interrelationships between crime and terrorism, people flip from being a terrorist on one side to Al-Qaeda to an Islamic State, from uh, a nationalist to, to whatever, however many times in a day. That I would suggest is when you need to have a methodology to actually start looking at the um to start unpicking it um and that's when you need to have a, a much more developed um sort of multifaceted plan which which goes to you know, sure the pointy end so uh, using uh police and uh prosecutorial powers uh, we don't we don't that's it we don't teach the the military military side and um, sometimes there's military support to to police but um there's there's the military side to some of the stand disruption planning but then I would suggest there are so many other soft options which are available out there. And when we ran this course, for example, in a country in East Africa, sure, one of the first options which went up on the board was involved drone strikes. But um, I would say 95% of the other options were develop this regulation, build a partnership with them, uh, develop this uh, relationship with that FIU overseas. Um, and actually, those were seen to be the ones which are going to have far more impact. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, and it's only that kind of method I suggest is going to start separating people's interests and, and understanding like you won't arrest that Hawala, that particular Hawala operator because they're probably more on, on the neutral side and um, anyone's going to do stuff if they've got a gun to their head. Um, but perhaps there's a way to actually 
flip them to become an, an informant, uh, for example, which is the kind of stuff I used to do. Um, so there's a whole whole range of different options available. Um, and that's why I like this kind of as, as a methodology and, and a toolkit, because it opens up, opens your mind to it. Um, I, before I, I um, uh, ask that we we move to one of uh, the questions where somebody has their hand up, I just want to say I really so I really appreciate your answer there, and I think that the something that maybe ac academics and practitioners don't always think think about or kind of think through is that a methodology like this ultimately the people who make those judgments might be sort of political leadership or people at very high and senior levels, um, and so without a method like this they might be making those decisions kind of like a sort of, you know, based on gut instinct or whatever information has been put in front of them or their preconceived ideas or whatever. So to have something that that provides that framework for accountability for decision making is really important. And in the, the UK, there's the, MO, the MOD have a the good operations guide coming out of Chilcot which actually yeah. the methodology here aligns really nicely with those principles about how you make good it decisions. aligns because we stole it stole quite well not stole anything but uh, we there's a lot of borrowings from this from a number of different um you know Chilcott actually did inform some of this methodology the the fundamental failures of, sort of intelligence and and sort of use of intelligence in decision making um and then some of the training that came as as a result of that um but we have been able to balance this by by delivering this in in many parts of the world and um, to be able to absorb different ways of of looking at problems and addressing them but uh yeah there's been a lot of borrowings which is part of this kind of institutional sort of memory or sorry um yeah institutional memory which um which i think we we've got a responsibility for yeah brilliant thanks um catherine would you mind unmuting anushka who has a question for oliver <laughs> Hello, good evening. Thanks. Hello. <laughs> I just introduced myself quickly. I'm actually, I'm a student still of, I'm studying international relations and development and I'm ab absolutely not a professional, experienced professional, but I'm rather passionate. So I've written some notes and I would like to ask perhaps like two questions, but they are kind of related. And thank you very much for this presentation, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, firstly, um, Regardless of all the effort you, you put into, into your missions and everything to, to tackle organized crime and uh, money laundering and etc. What if what if the, the problem, the, the rot is within within the core? So let's say um it's well known that the UK, especially London, is like a butler to the whole world and people or the companies or different countries can set up organizations offshore according to English laws because they are different and they can they can make um, imaginary company and they can launder those money. Hence, we have plenty of empty properties in, within Westminster Westminster area. We know why. Um, basically, we know that Western world, London, it was between the New York and London it is a center of of the of the of the show and perhaps is it as you said even like it would be so easier to if somebody makes um a fraud money fraud fraud of transferring the money it will be easier to to jail them but what if they're just too big to jail yeah. for example HSBC right the, the scandal with Cayman Islands a few years ago all of them involved at the time they they just they just they, they are living happily their lives probably you know they retired and they just they just live their lives like nothing happened yet it affected many people rapidly in the past also in mexico and all over the world so it's just very interesting so even though like regardless the effort we can put what does it mean doesn't does it mean anything? Because sometimes it might feel kind of pointless. Ah, and, yeah. yeah. No, you got your your like you said, you're still a young student. So you can't feel you can't be uh like that. It's for me, old person to be um get all cynical about stuff. Right. Um let me go and get into this. So um people are too big to be dealt with. Um yes, in some of the financial centers for sure. Every I think 
if you look at a problem set, if we're if we're in uh, developing countries and predominantly work, work with developing countries, but we have trained this for um, um, not the UK but another um, permanent five member. Um, yeah, so they they um, in in different regions you will have uh, financial centres which, by virtue of their location or whatever service they're providing, they will be providing the service either complicitly, unknowingly maybe just negligently. Um, so there's a scale of complicity we'd suggest um, to, to whatever regional uh, terrorist, organized crime groups, corruption uh, networks, that kind of stuff. Um, whether it's in um, the Gulf region, whether it's in the Far East, you have these different kind of financial centers. And so when you're doing that kind of business modeling, you look at that business modeling piece, yeah, that's part of the, that might be the move, that might be the store, where are those assets actually held? Um, and so without a doubt, that would enter into, and when we're dealing with this, if we're looking at a, a particular developing country in Africa, we actually do try and look, see where is the, where's the corporate banking, where's the um, correspondent banking relationships, where are they held? Um, because that may be an influence factor, that may be a significant factor down the line to actually then have a, um, uh, so encourage campaigning, encourage further research, take some of those discussions through um, other forums, the Wolfsburg uh, Forum, for example. Um, too big to, to jail or to, to fail. I don't believe in that. I think it's, it's a matter of peeling the onion, finding those points of vulnerability, get in there. There's, there's always ways to, to get in there. And it's not for me to name names or, or talk about particular countries at the moment. Um, uh, but um, no, I, I don't see there's ever... That's why I like this methodology. I've seen... Um, some of the least, um, well, young people, are, um, young, inexperienced people develop the most amazing disruption strategies by virtue of their, their imagination. The older you get, the more focused you are on what you think has worked in the past. Um, but if you've got a whole wide toolkit and a lot of enthusiasm, no, straight up. And, and this is a, as a methodology, a campaigning methodology as well, is, is quite, I'd, I'd suggest as effective not just working against organized crime groups, but other other kind of advocacy areas as well. About. Thanks, Oliver. I mean, focused on what, what maybe has worked in the past, but maybe a bit hesitant to try things uh, that, that haven't worked in other contexts, but you never know as well, I think. Um, yeah. Anushka, you said you had, you had two questions. Do you have a, a second quick follow-up question? If it's okay, because I know like time-wise, we might be back. Well, we have a couple of minutes left before we, we move on. So if, if you have um, a, a quick question to follow up and then if anybody else would like to put something in the chat or raise their hand, I, I do have a question too, but um, please do. Very quick one, just briefly. Uh, I will go like a few decades ago like in, in the past that what what if the, the whole system, the whole capitalism actually kind of supports this crime, globalized crime and, and emergence of it. So let's say, for example, I'll give an example because I, I've researched about it a lot. In the 1990s, when at the beginning, when after the fall of Soviet Union, countries, uh, post-USSR countries, for example, Bulgaria. So let's say those states, they just suffered a heart attack and they were not ready from one day to another, leave uh, Soviet Union and transfer to capitalism. Uh, let's say Bulgaria, they were famous for their Olympic for wrestles and everything, and they, all of them, very successful. And suddenly, they just lost their jobs, and the only the only thing what they knew was uh, was violence, and therefore, and they were paid for it, right? And then, basically, you lo you lose everything. You have you have nothing. Your economy is completely rotten, and the only thing what you left of is starts doing crime, smuggling, trafficking. I'm not saying that's right, that's correct. My question is more, what if many countries, even Afghanistan, they've got no other, other choice and this is their way to survive, whether it is whether it is licit or illicit, but everybody has to survive. I think that's similar. Thanks, Anushka. I think that's similar yep. to the, the question that Jonathan asked as well about the, um, the sort of the judging the effects on the, the ground of, an, of a successful case. So I'm um, looking at that um, very initial, but um, looking on um, indicators of effect and that kind of stuff, 
slide, going out and arresting a lot of people, going and arresting 250 people, any police officer who's vaguely worth it can go and arrest 250 people, easy. So, but will you actually prevent crime, um, encourage economic uh, development, social welfare in a given country? Is you know that's it's a it's a matter of what where your mission lies kind of thing you know and um, and often we are uh, we do run this as a methodology at a very kind of low level um, but then also we have sort of senior level briefings which goes up to a minister and, and the uh, case I gave I think has been briefed to a, the president of that country um, so it does so I think there is an impact there and uh, and then it's just a matter of yeah there's um, and the examples you gave that it's as it's as common now as it was then I mean, and incredibly challenging um in, in some countries where it's fundamental yeah you know, like i said there's they haven't been called out as failed states but essentially they are particularly on, in this area anyway but yeah no no you've got to keep positive on it i don't know and, and i think this this as a methodology i've seen it i've seen it work and you know colleagues who who teach this and run this uh, and people who've done equivalent parts of this kind of thing also seen it, it it just does work and it's it's value for money it's not banging your head against a brick wall or anything like that it's all doable so that's great thank you thank you oliver um are there any more questions before i mean i do have one one last question before we move on but i'd like to give others a chance to ask so a question i have for you oliver is oh. Sorry? Oh, Heather, do you want to do you want to do that one um, after the successes challenges one? Yeah, no, You've got no, fifteen can, minutes then, and then um, I can hold mine. So if you move you on hold. to successes and challenges, that sounds great. And then they may um, do some more. Um, let's do uh, yeah, so sort of successes and challenges, and these aren't these aren't my successes or anything, or our team's ones. It's the you know, brave men and women who are basically doing this and um, going to some of the questions. It's it may be the minister of or. Um, is the problem or the head of the police is, is the problem or the head of the intelligence agency is actually a problem because they are aligned or, or um, their their integrity is so compromised that they're no longer effective and that the whole organization uh, is is a, essentially out of bounds and if they're the the risk holder or they're the risk manager for illicit finance in, in that country what do you do so um impact um I think I'd like to sort of split this by um, um, policy and operational side. So on the policy side, I think uh, this is a fairly new, and we've been going with this about six years, I think, uh, we've been putting this together and then um, and using this method, using this terminology uh, in forums uh, like the Financial Action Task Force, who, um, although we're, we're observers there, uh, we do feed into and, and co-chair some of the, the papers and um, also feed into some of the policy discussions as well. Um, so I'd suggest a local, regional, international impact on, on the policy side. Um, <clears throat> so just in the last, uh, started around COVID actually, it was got mega busy during COVID, um, developing CTF strategies with uh, three countries in Africa. And those are kind of top level ones of the problem of um, a given uh, Al-Qaeda Islamic State uh, network in a given country. Um, right down to, say, mobile phone, um, uh, use of mobile money uh, by terrorist networks, so kind of zoomed in as well. Um, and th those are, you know, those are now part of the, the policy framework. You have a, um, in the AML-CFT world, you have the, the National Risk Assessment, the, the FATF Recommendation 1 National Risk Assessment. So what is the kind of problem? What's, what's coming at us? But also where are we weak as well? Um, then that usually translates into a national strategy but then there's a bit of a kind of a pause and a kind of intake of breath of what do we do actually do next um and so we'd suggest sometimes this is a methodology helps that next step of right now physically these are the these are the um this the the mission analysis the business model the the actual the planning step of the next specific steps arrest this person build that bridge with those uh, that community um, reach out to those different banks to develop a much better information sharing partnership that kind of very specific uh, kind of stuff um then on the the money laundering terrorist finance uh split we've actually been able to use this not just on, on i gave the example of um al-qaeda islamic state but 
We also use this on so environment crime, uh, drug trafficking, human trafficking, migrant smuggling um, in, in many different regions. Um, and that can be really zoomed down to a, a particular border crossing area in, in, in the Balkans, uh, to a, a kind of cigarette smuggling route in, in the Sahel region, uh, uh, timber crime and illegal deforestation in, in Southeast Asia as well. So we've got quite a lot of ways we can, can apply this as a methodology. Um, regional, so uh, there's a, a regional grouping of countries in the, in the Sahel, and they adopted, um, well, no, they haven't adopted it, but um, they've started discussing adopting it, which is, is as good as basically adopting it, um, adopting a uh, financial disruption planning methodology as part of the wider counterterrorism counterinsurgency strategy. Um, we'd suggest if you, you're running a counterinsurgency strategy and you don't um, think about the finance and uh, certainly the, the um, yeah, this, this was a mistake um, which was made and, and repeated uh, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, for example, by people who should have known better because they were managing these kind of, um, these, these issues in, in other uh, major cases they'd been worked on before. Um, but this was a, quite a seminal thing for, for the Sahel region because that actually gives them, gives them a whole new lens to look at the problem, the other sort of economic um, and development finance lens as well and the risks to that. Um, on the international side, um, we managed to get, um, uh, we saw a, a Security Council resolution uh, late last year, um, 2662, uh, which was a, a follow-on from the same one about the year before, where um, specifically uh, this, this language of disruption and fin financial disruption got into a Security Council resolution, which I'd suggest is quite quite new. It wasn't. Uh, we call on um, the, the government to arrest, prosecute, you know, that kind of really limited kind of role, um, limited type of um, activity. But here is just plan the disruption of Shabab's uh, operations and exploitation of the illicit financial system, for example. So, um, so having that on a, an example of this call for a, a both Somalia, but then also ourselves, um, and it's not just ourselves, but there's other teams within UNODC who um, feed into this on some of the border border management, border border protection side. Um, I thought that was quite a quite a major major success. Then on the operational side, one example in in the Sahel region. Again, um, we'd we'd worked with a country for um, several years and. Um, warmed them up to the, the concept of financial disruption planning. Why is it even, why is it even worth doing, uh, given all the different problems they've got? So working through the methodology, um, they, they started developing the, the intelligence um, of picture around the problem, which was um, a real mix up of, of organized crime, corruption and, and terrorism, um, financing instability in a, in a given area. Um, what came out of that was a focus on fuel smuggling, and that's one of the key so, um, key disruption options was going to be targeting the, not only the the individuals but also the the assets, so the the heavy machinery, uh, the properties which were were identified, um, and as a result of that, uh, earlier last year, um, a number of operations were undertaken, and um, and a lot of people and a lot of stuff got taken out. And we, we then um, did a sort of estimated impact around that, which, although operationally, it was probably quite significant. Perhaps more importantly, it was, it was about the development and, and the confidence building among the, the national authorities and their partners in, in other countries as well, that they were using some really good tools like the, um, the, the Karen-style asset recovery networks, uh, different international cooperation mechanisms, such as Egmont, um, to, to actually build those kind of partnerships against these really big and, and deep-seated um, so organized crime and organized crime groups. So, so it wasn't just the, the kind of operation impact against the group itself, it was also about the kind of developing the home teams as well. As well. Uh, last example, um, second last, sorry, um, is a, was a major organized crime group which still exists in uh, Southeast Asia, which is involved in um, predominantly environmental crime and illegal deforestation in, in several countries in uh, Southeast Asia. 
um, a, an I2 chart which which covers the, um, covering the different network. I, mean, I, I put some blobs on top of it. It's not quite as simple as that, but it shows they've got a finger in most pies in, the, in a given country. Um, we worked with the, the national authorities in that country, and they had no police um, capability really to go and actually arrest their way out of the problem. Um, but they took a whole range of different imaginative um, and used all the tools which they did have. And in this case, it was some really good regulatory action against the potential hostile takeover of um, one of the few banks in the, in the country. Um, and they managed to prevent that. They managed to initiate a whole load of tax investigations, like literally Al Capone style, and which then deterred that organized crime group from operating further um, within their country. Um, and that was essentially a kind of a, a death star moment when um, when, they, when they pushed them away. Um, and they they felt it was not it was not worth the risk um, given the amount of profit they were able to make, and um, they realised financially they were being targeted. That was only the only the start, so there's still kind of a big ongoing campaign there. Um, last point, I mean, I've been going on about the the financial disruption side. What we're now developing with, with the partners in, and other teams in, in the organisation is a systems analysis. So looking not just at the finance piece. But the wider system, the threat system, so the social networks, the supply chains, the information flows, um, and that may be um, organized crime groups talking together over uh, what they think are secure uh, mobile phones, for example. So, a great case around that. Um, and then risk flows and look at different ways of looking at a problem, and then still using the same disruption planning methodology again. So, so just on that, swapping out the, the business uh, modeling piece, which I, I talked through. And adding in a whole load more on social network, um, uh, product flows, um, uh, supply chain, the same kind of uh, concepts around supply chain um, securing, which we, we heard about during COVID. Um, but here we're looking at disrupting supply chains as opposed to securing. So there's just a, a few um, successes on the on the challenges. Mindful that we're coming up to nearly closing time. Internal, I think. If, I've gone through um, performance-based success, prosecution and police. We're a great prosecutor in our, our training team. Uh, he gets so he's still a prosecutor in, in a European country, and he gets so much. He gets beaten around so much because he runs these kind of um, uh, sort of uh, problem-solving meetings in his country. Um, and as a prosecutor, he's often encouraging colleagues not to prosecute. And, and he gets beaten up by his boss for that. So often when prosecution and police are leading the planning, um, then, then you tend to, if you're, if you're a hammer, you look for nails basically, uh, which can be a problem. Um, lack of senior level engagement, good ideas don't always go up, um, quite the opposite in, in many cultures and countries. And, um, and so we often try and uh, brief at a very senior level as well, uh, because for all the good ideas, uh, which can be can grow from from um, more junior junior grades. Bosses just won't listen to it. They'll just tell you to go out and start arresting those two hundred and fifty people. Um, corruption and distrust. People bang on about uh, international cooperation and uh, interagency cooperation, but if you know the minister is is the drug trafficker for the country, if um, head of the the police or customs is the person is the brother of the major organized crime kingpin, you know, who, which uh, investigation teams are going to want to work with that agency. So that, that really does, um, that is really difficult. And, and I think it's better to assume that when, when making these kind of interagency teams, uh, assume corruption and assume, um, yeah, assume sort of a lack of integrity rather than, rather than risking other stuff. Um, externally, I think, um, the, this context, if if you start selling this just as um, taking the funds and, and financial capability off organised crime groups, yeah, people usually get it. But if you start selling it more widely as, as support to social um, social welfare and economic development and safeguarding uh, sustainable safeguarding uh, development financing pathways, you get a far better better kind of buy in from a range of different people. Um, I mentioned about institutional memory, um, uh, impact, and perform impact and performance in, in technical assistance providers. Um, that might just be a wider whinge. Um, 
I, by that I mean some of the training which is, is offered as part of, say, that sustaining operation. So training new FIEs, training new investigators. It, it, I think it, there's a um, big opportunity for that to, to significantly improve. Um, and that last point on recognition of failing states, or aspects of failing states anyway, um, there's certainly some of the, the counter threat finance infrastructure within many countries we, we work with just isn't fit for purpose. And so in a sense, on the, on the threat finance side, they're, they're in free fall. Um, and that's the sooner that's called out or, or seen as a major, major problem, uh, the better. Um, you have a fantastic system of, of um, evaluation with the FATF and, and uh, to an extent with the, the uh, UN CTED as well. But, um, but still, there's, um, I think there's a lot of scope there. I think that's that. Heather, back to you. Thanks. I mean, your, your last point there about fragile states, I mean, you said something sort of quite early on in the section about confidence building and how success can really build confidence in taking these kinds of things forward again. And I think um, sort of lessons show that political will can sometimes really hinge on sort of key decision makers confidence and belief that there's actually going to be a chance of success so why would you stick your neck out why would you go up against really powerful people or you know disrupt your economy or whatever if you don't think that the capabilities are there if you don't have trust um in the people who are going to be implementing this so those successes can actually carry a lot of weight going forward and and sort of breeding more success but especially in i mean it's the same everywhere but in contexts where resources are very low capabilities are very low um and you know the, the degree of belief needed is really important um there's i mean there's the point um we made one argument it was a it wasn't a formal disruption planning process but with one counterpart in a, a major financial center global financial center which was fate which had failed miserably on its fatf um evaluation um also, no, it hadn't failed. Uh, it was looking like it was going to fail. Um, and it was it was a car crash waiting to happen. Um, we, we brought together some of those kind of senior sort of policy makers on, on the, the intelligence and the, the financial side in the country, together with some of the um, uh, NLCFT people in uh, major banks who are operating in that country. Bear in mind, this was a financial center. And they... Um, they pretty much laid out the, how much it was going to cost for getting a really bad rating uh, with the FATF. And that was their assessment on, well, you're going to, your business people will need to get a whole lot more enhanced due diligence done because there's going to be a, a really bad reputation around this, this country. Um, are people going to want to come here with their business or are they going to go to the, the other one just quite close by? And uh, we didn't even make the argument about the financing of terrorism, financing of uh, migration, crime, uh, drug trafficking, and all the other social harms. Um, in that case, it was the the pure financial number, and um, the light went on, and there's some amazing reforms took place, and a long way to go on some of the effectiveness side, but the fundamental frameworks were swung into action immediately. So um, sometimes it's it's how you pitch the, I think where where you prod the beast kind of thing. That's the you know, really good effect. And that's, you know, having that methodology there gives you something to go in and have those conversations with as well. Something yeah, really yeah, for sure. offer in return. Um, any questions for Oliver on successes and challenges? So one last one for me that I had was around, you talked about multi-agency working and also about trust. And it struck me throughout your, your talk today, um, the, the sort of real emphasis on cooperation and coordination. So you've got different types of agencies within government, but also the private sector, civil society or so on. And you might have actors within that that aren't actually natural partners. So, you know, civil society and intelligence agencies, for example, is one that, that jumped to mind, but that's, you know, there, there's a whole range there. So in, in reality, how do you actually, how have you seen that cooperation come together and some of that kind of natural distrust fall away um, in terms of this process? Um, I think it's, 
yeah, there, there need to be kind of I don't know, legal um, institutional frameworks in place so that people are allowed to physically to talk to each other. Um, and uh, police and intel folks won't just won't talk to to others because they'll get arrested and, and thrown in jail in, in many countries. Um, I think some other countries, uh, European countries um, and Western countries, I think can be a lot more open to that kind of that sharing of information. Often there's a leakage as well of staff from government agencies into the financial sector and maybe into some NGOs as well uh, who, are, who are campaigning on these issues. And so there's, there may already be those kind of human relationships. Um, so yes, there needs to be those kind of information pathways to be able to share that um, information and maybe between banks as well um, and financial institutions um, so that the pathway for information sharing isn't only um, into the FIU and then they they uh, disseminate kind of maybe sanitized uh, risk indicators to, to the others. Sometimes it's good to create those kind of super SARS, as it were, the super SDRs where banks can come together, look at a, a given problem, and then dump a whole load of information onto an FIU. So that can work really nicely. Um, on the other side, where we've seen, um, you know, where we've helped build um, kind of task forces, I suppose you can call them. Task forces are a difficult word because people throw it around because they think it's, it's easy you write it on paper and immediately people come and work together they don't um and uh, for that distrust reason so i think it's that that relationship building um we do it through um kind of long-term professional development and um, training together and then getting coming together so sort of smaller groups and then working them through this kind of a process, this kind of a planning process. And they start thinking, well, you know something, but you can't do anything with it. Um, and you can do something with that information. So how about you guys start talking to, together and um, figuring it out? So usually those kind of, that kind of relationship building, and it's just human and it's, um, it does take a bit of time. But once you've got those kind of core, pe core of people who are, um, who are very, I mean, we do see uh, the positive here is that no matter the most challenging countries you can think of, we've seen some most the fantastic people, brave people who, you know, despite all the odds, <clears throat> they may not be, they may be police, but they can't actually do, do police work. So they actually look across, make friends with other people, kind of phone a friend kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and those people can take really significant action against those uh, kind of those groups. So, so yeah, it's a mix of the, the institutional, but I don't think just because um, those pathways are created or, or that kind of policy is created that that's going to immediately translate into human action. It is, um, yeah, it's, it's hard work. And for me, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky with some of my team who, who spend so much time on, on the training, um, not just actually training, but actually helping people to bridge um, bridge those divides and in countries where people have been in civil war against each other um, not too long ago and and they're planning against some pretty hard pretty hard networks so no no it's there's positives on that for sure I think that's actually a really nice place to end a sort of reminder that behind um, methodologies like this if we want to have a chance of disrupting the sorts of activities that you and colleagues are working on which cause some of the worst harms um, out there on, on uh, ordinary people's life. It depends a lot on, on some very brave people um, to, be, um, to be behind this methodology and these processes as well. Um, and uh, that's always a nice thing to remind us of when it comes to talking about this. Um, on that, I think we are right at the end of time here, and I just wanted to say, um, firstly, thank you very much to Oliver for a great presentation. Um, I will be following up on a few things where I think there's some really interesting uh, synergies and stuff to, to discuss as well. Um, and thanks to participants um, for uh, being here and for listening and for asking questions and so on. And, and finally, thanks to, to CIVED for hosting this uh, discussion as part of their seminar series. Um, I think the recording Recording should go up on the, the website as and when, so keep an eye out for that and on social media as well. Um, with that, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, those of you in the, the Northern Hemisphere, have a good evening or morning for the rest of you. Thanks. Thanks so much. See you all.